Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope everybody is doing well. I actually have something very exciting to share today because about one month ago, I made a video on this new ultra aggressive weapon that you can use against one to D4. And today I got to use the wagon gambits for the first time against an actual grandmaster. And I was playing on Lee Chess. This was a three minute game of Blitz and I'm gonna be deep diving into this. In a way, it's kind of gonna be an extension of the original video. We're gonna be deep diving into one of the main lines and one of the most critical lines that you need to know if you wanna play the wagon gambits. And last thing I need to let you know before before we jump into it is I did actually record this video for the Vampire Chicken channel. So if you want to see my live thoughts of me actually playing the game, that's going to be on the second channel. Go ahead and check it out. Links to like everything in the description below. Now I'm going up against the Grandmaster and he opens up the game with pawn to d4. So I play knight to f6 and after c4, I play pawn to a6, which is kind of a really weird, strange move. But I have this idea that I'm going to be playing b5 and a little bit of a wing gambit. But wait, that's not the end of the story because after I play b5, he takes, takes, knight Knight takes b5, my opponent has very happily won a pawn, but you know what? If you liked that one so much, why don't you take another? Pawn to e5 is the move that I played, and after he takes this one, I hop right on into e4, and in a way, this is kind of like some sort of Fajarowitz gambit mixed with a wing gambit, and my main threat is just to immediately play bishop to b4, which if it were my turn, would just simply win on the spot, so black plays something really weird, you just win the game immediately. Well, my opponent understands that bishop b4 is coming, and he plays the most common move, which is knight to c3. You take this knight, which is on kind of a weird square, you put it back, and you shield against bishop to b4, because now after bishop to b4, which is what I played, you you can defend the knight again with bishop to d2, and uh, this is where we get to a very interesting and critical position where you have the opportunity to either play for the wagon gambit trap, which is a very dubious trap that equalizes. It's not a trap that wins the game. It's not like that. You might be able to equalize, though, against the grandmaster, or you can try to just equalize in this position. And if you really wanted to play objectively the best, uh, you would swap here twice one way or another, take these guys off, and the fact that white is two pawns up uh, doesn't really matter that much because they have so many weaknesses that you might be able uh, to get, you're going to get at least one pawn back, and very often this is a position that's a lot easier to play with black. Or you can play a little bit more dubious, have a little bit more fun, and just decide to take this bishop, which actually on the face of it seems to be the more principled option for black. And after the queen takes back, you play knight to c6, and you go directly after this pawn. Now we're almost certain to be able to win one of these pawns back, because after knight to f3, we play queen to e7, and it's not going to be very easy for white to try to hang on to this guy. So my opponent plays uh, pawn to e3, knight takes, and this is where most people fall for the trap. And my opponent didn't directly fall in for it, but he kind of fell in for it later. And what he played in this game was bishop to e2, resisting the urge to immediately trade on e5. Uh, but before we can get into this and kind of understand the end game that we got in our game, I just need, I need one aside. This is the only thing that's going to get us sidetracked uh, in this video. The main line that you're going to see most frequently is knight takes e5, and if they do do this, they're almost certainly falling in for the wagon gambit trap you're gonna take, they're gonna play bishop to e2, and this is where you hit them with the big stunning surprise move that if you haven't seen before, get ready for it, it's rook to a3, and this leads actually directly to an end game uh, that Sockfish will evaluate as 0, 0.00. It goes castles. Now you take this opportunity. Obviously, we should just point out very briefly that obviously uh, they cannot be taking your rook. The rook is immune, and it's a really cool square because from here, you're actually threatening to take this guy, which wins one of the pawns back. So you, you get all of your material back. You get to some end game. You win back your exchange. You get to here. They take back, and this is the starting point for the wagon gambit end game. And this is it. Put it on Stockfish, 0. 0.00. Black can do basically anything, but I want to take some time to just kind of explain that this is an endgame that I've actually been studying, and this is the kind of thing that if you can get to some sort of endgame that you know, we're 18 moves into theory, but obviously you should still know what you're meant to do from here. Um, and the line that I've kind of come up with that just seems to be working out really well for me and obviously everything's objectively equal, but you play d5, you put this bishop on e6, and the reason for this is you're trying to keep this bishop from ever being able to use uh, this a8 square, and opponents seem to think that this pawn is going to end up being very strong, and what most people are doing, and I've had this like 10 or 11 times already, is they just push, they just push, 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 like this pawn is about to promote, but then you hit them with this, and if they keep going, at some point your king approaches, your rook comes to the a file, and this pawn goes to c5. Let's just make all of these things happen. Uh, they probably want to push right away. But something like this is kind of the ideal setup for black. And you're hoping 
to be able to approach this pawn and just simply take it. Maybe you can use this guy to kick the bishop out if you need to, but this setup is actually very strong. It's preventing this king from being able to enter into the game. Uh, the bishop is not able to use this diagonal to really harass you, and the A pawn very often becomes weak, and I've had a lot of games where I just simply run over and I take that pawn, and then even then it's probably still like 0-0, zero, zero. it's probably still some sort of draw, but opponents get very disheartened and they have to defend a slightly worse position. So that is the kind of thing that I'm trying to get. However, in Instead of taking right away on e5, my opponent resisted and played bishop to e2. Again, just developing a piece, one of the most logical moves. I decide to get castled, but now he takes on e5. Okay, a fascinating development. And after I went here, he decided to play bishop to f3. And he's going ahead. He's put his bishop on a very strong diagonal. He's attacking my rook, but I was happy to move my rook. Because I played rook to a3, <laughs> in a way. This is kind of a very similar trap, only the bishop has somehow magically gotten onto this diagonal. And obviously, again, you just simply can't take because you're going to be losing your queen. And when my opponent gets castled, I take on c3. And this is basically kind of the same little trap. And after this recapture, I get a pawn back. Then I get an exchange back. We trade, and boom, voila, we are here. Now, the difference is... This is the same exact position, only instead of having a bishop on e2, my opponent has a bishop on f3. And it makes a little bit of a difference because at least from here, the bishop is able to defend the queening square. So I bring out my bishop to a6, and I'm imagining in some sort of line that I'm going to try to do the same thing. I'm going to try to get my rook over, but I no longer can play with d5. I have to come up with something a little bit different. Now my opponent comes up with something very clever. Rook to c1, just provoking my c-pawn, so I decide to move it. And then he plays rook to d1 one poking at my deep on again and he's just kind of forcing me to move forward and then he tries to open up the position with pawn to e4 so he's trying to make my pawn structure weak so that he can tear it down which is probably a very reasonable idea so we get to this position my c pawn is attacked i play bishop to b5 and in my head i'm thinking i'm gonna put a rook on a8 i'm gonna try to get my king out so that there's no back rank issues and i am still gonna try to demonstrate that this guy is a lot weaker than my guy if i can do all of that i have a shot at winning this game. My opponent makes Luft. He also very aggressively takes kingside space, which is going to be a theme. And I played rook to a8 because it looks like, okay, rook to a8, I'm going to go here next so there's no back rank threats and everything is going to be good. But I've actually made a little bit of a mistake with this move. Probably what I need to do is make Luft like some other sort of way and only then bring my rook over. But uh, I didn't see the tactical move that my opponent would have here. And the move that my opponent should play but didn't, uh, what did he do? He defended the pawn this way, which is what I kind of expected, and then my king sort of escapes. But he could have played pawn to a4. This would have been uh, a very tricky move, because if I take with my rook, okay, I'm getting back rank checkmated. That's easy enough. But if I take back with my bishop, I get into trouble after rook to a1. This pin is actually very annoying, because now somehow I need to make luft, but then he can directly attack my bishop. Now, the game is not entirely over here, because I can take this bishop, get to some position like this, where I go here, and my bishop comes back, and I'm able to defend this pawn. And this is probably not so easy for white to be able to win, but this is probably probably something my opponent should have tried to have gone for. But uh, instead of that, he played rook to d2, which was what I expected. My king gets out, so there's no longer back rank threats. And after his king moves up, I bring my rook to a3 in order to cut off the king. And I'm feeling very good about the position, even though it's probably still around equal. I like my chances here. This is something I feel very pleasant. My opponent continues to grab space. He chucks his h-pawn at me. My king moves up the board. He's running his pawn down, and I'm very happy to play pawn to h6. And uh, I feel like this is actually a really comfortable position, and we'll see. Are these pawns barreling down at me going to become some sort of strength that white is somehow able to blow me off the board, or will he push all of his pawns, creating a bunch of weaknesses? that I'm later able to recapture. Let's wait and see. He plays pawn to g4, grabbing even more space. And now I go for c5. Time to push my passed pawn. Uh, the rook decides to come in. I play bishop to c4. And I'm allowing this rook to come in. But I'm also targeting this a pawn. And I didn't think that this was necessarily playing for a draw at this position. Because after he goes here, this pawn is protected. So I'm able to advance to d6. After uh, what I thought was going to happen, which is rook to b6, I wasn't sure how I was going to continue. Instead, my opponent went here, which is actually a very large mistake. Like, it's a sensible move, and I think my opponent is still here trying to play for a win, uh, protecting this pawn, and I don't really want to trade my bishops and allow him to take this guy. So uh, what, what I thought would happen was instead he would play rook to b6, and we'd 
you know, potentially we could just make some sort of draw like this. But I was kind of wondering to myself, can I go here and play this move, allowing pawn to f5? And if I want to continue to play for some sort of win, this is the way to do it. And it turns out that this actually is very possible because after f5, I have this move, king to e5. And it gets very complicated because takes, takes, White can do either one of these moves, and if they take this way, it's actually quite easy. I can play rook to f3 and get this pawn, and it's probably still a draw, but at least, you know, we're trying to play for something. And if this pawn instead decides to advance, I can take this guy first, and wherever the king goes, uh, get my rook back in time. And this also probably is a draw, but again, it's, it's fighting to try to play for something. So that was one potential line that could have happened, but we don't need to know because instead of checking me a bunch of times, my opponent decided to drop back. And this actually allows me a really powerful move. Bishop to d5. And in this way, I attack your rook. I also get out of the way so that my rook can potentially swing over to e3. I'm keeping an eye on kind of everything. This is the super powerful bishop. <laughs> All four diagonals. It has some sort of functional work. So a truly amazing square. Also, by the way, I've gotten out of the way of my c pawn. So my opponent decided to give me a check. I get out of the way. And then he plays f5, which I don't fully understand, but I think he's kind of running out of realistic options at this point. I push my pawn. Uh, he goes up to attack my bishop. And this is where I decide to play uh, bishop to f3. And what I thought was going to happen in the game is exactly what happened. I thought he would go here, he would take this pawn, and in the meantime, I would be busy winning two pawns. However, this is actually kind of like an amazing... Go ahead and pause. This is like a study-like position. It's white to move and save the game. There's something absolutely incredible that I never would have seen in a million years. Uh, this is your one like study puzzle from this. White can actually save this game. And I thought what was going to happen is what actually happened. He played here, and I was able to get two pawns for one. Uh, a very awesome deal. But it turns out he could have saved the game with this remarkable move, pawn to g5. This is the move that saves white. And the idea is, after you recapture on g5, white could have played the only saving move, pawn to f6. And no matter how I capture... White has a way to save this game. Now, if I take with my king, for example, he is able to go here and he's going to be winning my bishop. So wherever I decide to go, he's able to take this guy. And this still should somehow be a draw. I can play c3 to prevent this rook trade. And we got this guy kind of blockaded, but it's really weird. And somehow this is a draw according to Stockfish. So this was a possible save. Obviously, if he gets my bishop, that seems like a pretty good deal. But what if... I decide instead to take this with my pawn. Well, here, he has only move h6. Okay, it's becoming clear he's going to try to promote that guy. But now, I can play an only move, g4. <laughs> the idea is to give this check. And after h7, g3, the king takes this way, bishop to e4. And I'm going to have to sacrifice my bishop. Wherever this king goes, I'm going to take here. He's going to take it, and we're going to get to this wild position, which again, Stockfish says, yeah easy draw. And yeah, okay, probably it is. But wow, okay, I mean, a lot of incredible stuff that he would have had to have found, but he could have saved the game <laughs> with g5 and f6. Kind of wild. But as expected, he decided to go for the c pawn. I make this trade, and now I'm just simply winning the game, because after it all, okay, he kind of forces me up the board. I'm not so upset about going up, but now I have this outside h pawn, which is going to win the game. He decides to go here, whatever, I'll just take that. Don't mind me. I'm walking up the board. I have more things. I voluntarily go into a pin because I realize I'm going to be able to defend my bishop. I'm going to be able to come back, use these guys to shield, get this h pawn running down the board at some moments. And this is exactly what happens. And in this position right here, my opponent decided to resign facing a mate in three. Here I simply win. Uh, I'm able to give this check. I'm able to go here. Very strong move and then promote to, I don't know, probably a rook. And if you did like this, this is how I defeated a Grandmaster with the Wagon Gambit. Check out all the links in the description below. And if you liked it, make sure you subscribe. We're almost to 50,000. Please help me, please help me. It would be great. Bye.